Hello and welcome to another episode of Deep Web Decoded. I am your host for this week's episode, Porter Stoll from the Filecoin Foundation. Today I have a very special guest, founder of AI Guardian, Chris Hackney. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, Chris? Uh, excellent. Good to see you. Um, it's a good day here. It's always fun on a Friday to get these things in. So excited to kind of talk about Responsible AI a little bit with you. Yeah, we got a lot on the docket today. Uh, really interesting show. What I like about having Chris uh, on the show is he's not your typical Filecoin participant, but hopefully uh, you will see the light uh, and intersection as this conversation unfolds. But Chris, given that most of the people on the on the show today may not know who you are or what you've been up to, why don't we start with who you are, what you've been up to? Thank you. That's that's probably a good start. I'm a little insulted by your audience that they don't know who I am already. But uh, that's, no. uh, so, so no. Me, uh, pleasure to talk to everyone. Um, been in the tech industry 20 plus years at this point, um, a variety of startups and larger enterprises um, specialized in SaaS. Um, so I've had uh, four very strong exits over the last 15 years, um, has spent uh, good stints at places like Oracle, um, but really have been focused in areas that are emerging um, and how you kind of bring those into organizations as they scale, um, starting with social, mobile, um, SaaS enterprises along the way. And now I see the same thing with AI and generative AI. Man, I forgot you did a stint at Oracle. That was yes. all of a sudden a long time ago. Yes. But uh, uh, very humbly stated your four exits. Uh, okay. If you want to learn more, you should research some of Chris's ex companies or past, uh, past accomplishments on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to start with is you have healthcare, you have, you know, media and marketing. You have sports entertainment. This is a very diverse background for someone who may not know or understand the common thread that you saw within each of the opportunities that you've had over the last decade. Yeah, yeah. I it, it yeah. If you look, go to my LinkedIn page. It looks a little all over the place, right? Um, but I've been a big proponent of the old Wayne Gretzky quote: "You know, skate where the puck is headed." Um, and that is the thread. Um, you know, I was, I had a very successful career at Coca-Cola as one of the brand managers for Coke, uh, here in Atlanta, uh, which is my home, uh, and could see the rise of digital and went to WebMD, uh, WebMD, I could see the rise of social and went to a SaaS company that was driving social and the third preferred developer for Facebook. And so, you know, what I get enamored with is where tech is taking us, um, as far as business execution is concerned. Um, and each of those, I, I still remember a day banking on Facebook and people were like, how could you put ads on Facebook? It's a personal environment. And you could see as a media executive, oh, they're absolutely going to put ads on there. And that's going to be the future of that. And it's going to be revolutionary because not because of what Facebook is on the front end, but because of what Facebook is on the back end. It's a data collection machine um, in real time. And that's going to turn into ad monetization. And you're seeing you're right at the precipice of this with generative AI now uh, as well. And so if you if you think about careers, and I would encourage others to do the same, think about where that puck is going and what gets you excited um, and how it's going to transform the businesses all around us. And then, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's a fun path to take. Yeah. So let's not mince words. Let's get right to the meat and potatoes of the, the discussion today. Chris, where is the puck going? So it is absolutely going to generative AI. Uh, it's one of those areas. I've, I've been through a lot of tech waves um, over the years, especially hell to the dawn of this with it, the internet uh, back when I was in college. Um, and there's always a lot of hype and it's very hard to separate the hype from the substance. Um, but um, I think it's very clear that this is going to be one of those big, big waves um, that has real substance. Um, and it's going to really transform every business and every function within those businesses. Um, and that's rare. Even, you know, internet and a few um, waves have done that. But um, if you're in finance, if you're in sales, um, if you're in development, it doesn't matter. Uh, to be great at your job and to be great in your function, you're going to have to know generative AI and you're going to have to bring it into what you do. Um, and so we're at a unique point in, in time where this is cresting and Last thing I'll say on it is it's not cresting because of an accident. Um, you're at a unique point where computing power on one end um, and big data on the other have come together uh, to fuel these these LLMs, which are really just giant neural networks. Um, but the, the thing you need for a neural network to be really good is those two things. I need a lot of data and I need a lot of computing power. And those two other trends came together at the right moment 
to make this incredible at this stage. And that's why it's really real and why it's happening now. Um, so we, we see it as something everyone should really pay attention to. I know we've had other waves where it's kind of crested and fallen sometimes, but the, the hype is real on this one. Um, and it's really fun because it's just like the beginning of the internet where you don't know where it's going yet, um, but you know it's going to be something. Yeah. And again, there's, there's a lot of different things that the future could look like, but you have a specific vision on where you think the puck is going. And that was the catalyst for you starting Guardian AI, AI, AI Guardian, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah, that vision is, here's the thing, you're gonna have a million uh, amazing AI features uh, coming out. You see it every day, how the new ChatGPT visual uh, beta is out. It looks incredible. Um, Spotify came out uh, the other day with their new um, podcasting and transcription services. It looks amazing. Um, but uh, there are a lot of unique factors to AI um, that make a governance of this extremely important. And there's not a lot of people there yet. Um, we've seen this with data privacy and some other areas, um, hell with crypto and, and other areas as well in blockchain, um, where the industry is going to move as fast as it can because that's what drives innovation. But you're going to see, especially in this case, governments try and catch up really quickly in a way they haven't on regulation and, and uh, law, laws being passed starting with the EU AI Act um, and some others coming. Um, and we believe as a software company, there's an easy way to solve that through uh, government's governance software as a software suite. And so that's what we're building out is trying to make sure that companies can innovate at the pace of AI alongside the risk management they do with our system. And so if we can do that, we you know, empower them to adopt AI through their organizations, understand the risks and manage it um, as they go forward. Yeah, you make a... Interesting. You know, we talked about where the puck is going, uh, but we haven't talked about yet. What is it that people don't see coming that is that you see coming down the pipe within the terms of AI? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. It's, it depends on how you talk about people, right? Is it people like you and I who are deep in technology? Is it the broader population? I think when you look at the latter, right, the broader population, um, there's a lot of surveys that are, are in studies from Pew and others that have come back. This isn't on anyone's radar. Um, most people in the United States where we're at um, haven't heard of OpenAI and ChatGPT, um, you know, much less played in it or used it for something substantive. Um, it's a little bit of this scary thing out there that their teacher or their kids is worried about at school, the kids using it to cheat or something else. But they don't really have a good vision of it yet. It's very much like early days. I mean, we were both in cloud in the early days and you'd see all the ads and you're like, your, your, your uncle would go, what the hell is cloud? Right. This is what is this garbage? Right. And you're like, well, it's this thing where you put it in a server and you share servers in this other place. Most people have the same view now. They know it's something out there. Maybe it's something that's going to kill us all in a few years and, and reach sentience. Um, maybe it's another hype cycle, but most don't. Um, and so I think general population, it's up to folks like us to build the tech responsibly um, so that it doesn't become this scary thing. You don't have your Cambridge Analytica moment in this space um, that sets the entire industry back. Um, and we're good, honestly, guardians and stewards of, of this, this wave as it happens. And uh, that's, that's my focus today. Yeah. You know, I love your talking about the general public and I 100% agree with that's a good assessment of like the current state of people's awareness. But I, what, what really makes me curious is that even with the tech-focused individuals out there, uh, I'm not sure, unless you're really deep into an AI startup, that yeah. they see or can forecast some of the regulatory concerns or issues that are coming down the pipe. Yeah. What do you see in terms of like upcoming regulation? I know, I know it's, it's going to be an iterative process, but... Um, you know, nine, six to nine months out, a year out, we could be talking about regulation and AI in a much different fashion than we are today. Yeah. And, and it's a great question to ask, um, because I'd say if there's one blind spot of people who are in our shoes and technology, um, it's, it's regulation and, and legal, um, meaning their, their history here um, for other things has always been that it's slow. Um, the, the, the thing is, yes, yeah, sure, regulation's coming, but that's way down the line. We're going to go break stuff and, and innovate. And then we'll figure out the regulation when it gets here. Um, and honestly, that's served tech fairly well as an ethos, right, for, for years. The difference here is, is twofold on regulation. Um, first, um, this is a technology that's front and center in people's lives. It's not something like most technology where it's backstage and you don't see it. 
just like how people are using your data before. You didn't see it, so you didn't know. Um, you just got free stuff like Facebook um, that was monetizing you on the back end. And so I think because this is going to be front and center for people, this is going to have societal impacts early, job impacts early. Um, you're going to see a population who's more concerned and nervous about it. And it's a, it's honestly, it's one of the few winner categories of regulation for politicians to really go after and make sure they're on top of. Um, what do you so think of as a winner category, by the way? Yeah. Um, meaning it's popular for them to do. There's a populism behind it, right? Um, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if we're talking U.S., um, it's something that you can go and say you're protecting people in a way that, against something that seems a little scary to them today um, and is is a winner. And honestly, I think it's the right thing to do too. So I'm not um, kind of backtracking on that. It's just more, you're going to see some populism come up on it. Um, and so I think on that side, you, you're going to have a willingness to do so. Um also, you have the industry. This is one of the first times the industry has actually gotten behind it too early on. Most of the time, the industry has fought it. Um, and so the second thing I was going to say there too is the other thing that's going to help legislation move quicker, and then I'll talk about specific legislation, is they're not starting from ground zero like they have before in most. Um, when you look at the EU AI Act, um, you look at the White House AI Bill of Rights, uh, you look at the work that California is already moving forward in their legislature. They're all starting off the foundation of data privacy legislation they've already passed. So when you think about how the sausage is made, the sausage is going to move a lot quicker because it's already got a foundational basis in existing legislation that they're going to add and expand onto. And so honestly, we think you're looking at six to nine months before major legislation like the EU AI Act is passed. Uh, you're probably looking at Q1 of next year uh, for some of it to really start. And so I think that's the blind side of tech is they think it's going to come later than it usually, like, like it usually does. And that's not going to happen here. Yeah. You know, I can't make it a day in my, in my job without someone discussing the adoption life cycle, whether it's my industry, AI, it doesn't matter. Like you can't, it just shows up everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's your innovators, your early adopters and your early majority. Yeah. Um, and, you know, usually the early, the, the early majority are also known as the fast followers. And those are your bigger enterprise type organizations, S&P 500, publicly traded mm -hmm. uh, entities, the, the name brands that people think of in business. How do you, you know, as you look at what's coming, how do you see the early majority uh, looking at AI and what are they going to need to be adopters? Yeah, no, that's, that's another great question. And it's it's complicated. Um, so what I mean by that, I wish I always had simple answers, um, but this is a complicated one. It, it mean it, What it means is there's no, even amongst the Fortune 500, even amongst the, the part of the Fortune 500 that are in highly regulated industries, uh, healthcare, insurance, finance, um, if you ask any of those companies, and we talk to a ton of them, um, where does the risk management for this sit in your organization? Who owns AI? It's all over the place absolutely all over the place. Sometimes it's your CISO, sometimes CIO, CDO. Sometimes it's just sitting with someone who's an enthusiast, like your head of product uh, or CTO. Um, so the first problem is it's it's there's no established guidance for where the risk management sits in their broader compliance and other efforts. And so you get very different approaches there. Um, I think the second thing there that makes it complicated is um, it depends on the risk tolerance of the company. Um, and a lot of that comes from the board and the CEO level on down. Some are being told, do whatever you can to run as fast as you can. We'll figure out the broken pieces later. Um, others have a lot of risk management infrastructure in place that's very, very nervous about that speed and pushing back now. And I think that's why when you look at most companies, their form of governance right now is the most simplistic, which is what we call thou shall nots, right? Someone has sent out something that says you shouldn't, you can't do X. You can't go on chat GPT with proprietary information. You can't use X. That's as sophisticated as most of them have gotten right now. And that's going to be fine for a couple of months, but um, they're going to have to get more advanced as the year progresses. Interesting. Yeah. So bring everyone back to what, what AI Guardian is doing to solve this problem, or maybe even just a portion of the problem. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So um, think of, we are a GRC SaaS system. It's like any other ones, what you'd have for data privacy or other SOC 2 compliance. Um, if you know like a one trust for data privacy, you know what we're doing. Um, and what those systems do is they bring order to that chaos around what you're, do what you're doing, especially as you move fast, and simplify it. So for us, we ask basic questions that lead into our software, right? We ask, 
do you know all the AI projects that are going on at your company? Um, most companies cannot answer that right now. It's every, every group for themselves. Do you have policies that you've distributed and gotten asked attestations to? No. Do you have approval processes for that? Do you have a risk management structure where you're grading out the risk of these projects and you know how to mitigate those risks? So when you, when you ask what we do, we solve those problems, right? And that's GRC is a fun acronym, but really it comes down to basic things like that. Um, we provide a software solution that lets you, instead of using email chains and a memorandum you sent out at some point, bring it all together in one environment. The organization as a whole can log in, see all of those things in motion, and manage against them responsibly um, under the idea of responsible AI. So. Do you predict, I know it's always hard to predict who your customers will be or how a product gets interpreted when you put it out to the marketplace, but do you predict more regulated industries? as your customer base, or do you see universal applicability to all industries? Yeah, I think for us, if you're asking specifically to us, um, I, I would say it's probably going to be a level removed from that. Um, but you're going to see those heavily regulated industries move first. Um, they're just used to this. They're used to leaning forward into it. By the way, they also have much more of a penalty system in place if they don't get it right. Um, but those entities usually are going to rely just as someone who's been in this industry for 20 years. Um, they're going to usually rely more on seven figure consultants in other firms, the Deloitte's, the McKinsey's of the world uh, coming in um, as an entire SWAT team to do it. Um, when you think about someone like us and how one trust did this in Banta or Strata and SOC 2, you're thinking that next year, right? They need to keep up with the JP Morgans of the world, um, but they don't have that budget. Um, and so they need to get 80% of the same functionality in a much more streamlined and affordable solution. And that's where tech providers like us come in and can really help the majority of companies out there versus the highest echelon who has money to, to throw. Right. Yeah. So full disclosure, I told you I'd warn you when I was going to do this, <laughs> but I'm going to slowly begin to pivot the conversation from AI into yeah. decentralized storage. Sure. Because this yeah. is a Filecoin audience, and I actually think that this topic has a lot of revel uh, relevance for decentralized storage. I'm just, just preparing you for the transition. Uh, but when I talk to a lot of lawyers and people across AI in preparation for Phil Vegas plug, you can see Chris speak at the Phil Vegas conference next week in Las Vegas. He's got a more in-depth talk on everything uh, AI Guardian and his views, uh, expanded views on the industry. But what the you know these stakeholders said and uh, about AI was that um, they most companies do not want to save their AI training sets, their data sets, um, except if they were regulated, because uh, you know ultimately, as you said, regulated industries have more of a you know penalty infrastructure in place if they don't do things according to specs. Right. Yeah. How does that statement land with you? Um, is that consistent with what you've seen? Yeah, it's it's very, very true. I Just to get to the, the heart of the matter, right? No one wants to record things that, are, that can come up in discovery. Um, shocker. Um, and you're going to expect a lot of lawsuits. And even the biggest players in their newest versions are not opening, open sourcing their training uh, data um, for this reason. Um, they could, they used to, when it was a smaller game, um, absolutely the biggest players did, but you're now seeing them come out and saying they don't want to do that for probably this reason. It's the unstated reason. Um, so I think it's from a training model perspective, it is absolutely, absolutely true. Um, the nice thing with regulation too, is it not only the penalties is one aspect, but it puts boundaries on why someone can come after you. Um, and a safe environment by which to share that information uh, under the you know, compliance of that regulation. So it at least gives you some structure to the game and your lawyers aren't worrying about every avenue that could come at you. Um, so I think, yeah, we absolutely do. Um, the one other thing I would say on that, though, and I will talk about this a little more in Vegas, too, is that's only one side of the data game, right? That's those building models and how do you do that, the training data you need. The other side's just probably actually more important, maybe more important for most of your clients, which is, who owns the data that goes into training models, right? Um, there's going to be with AI, a generative AI specifically, a much higher premium on data. The value of data is going to go through the roof uh, because all these systems, they need mountains of data to feed them. So I would predict you're actually going to see a lot more environments where people wall off their data um, and protect, organize it, and retain it in a way they haven't before. 
and then peel it off, right? Hey, if you need six LLM models, we'll pay you for this data. You want to keep all the data you can because you don't even know what aspects are going to be the best parts for the training until you monetize it. And so I think you're going to see that flip as well. This is why Bloomberg came out early with their own private LLM because they've got all the financial data in the world just sitting there that they can now monetize in ways they've never thought of before. Yeah, I mean, I was at IBM, you were at Oracle. Both organizations have been talking about data monetization for well over a decade. Yep. Are we finally here? Is this is this the time? I think as a use case, we are. Um, and I'm going to say the only thing that, I think the thing that will accelerate it is something that's come out the last couple of weeks. Um, Getty Images just released their own. Um, Google has talked about this on their side. Um, it's it's compensation for creators through the generative AI chain. So meaning um, Getty Images has launched their own LLM that came out this week, um, but they've also launched it with a compensation structure that gives credit back, monetary credit back to the creators whose images trained the outputs, right? The minute you do that, you have a chain of custody that incentivizes people to monetize better throughout the system. It gives compensation back to the creators. So now they're creating more. Like we've talked a lot about the death of the creator because of these. If you get this right, it can be really powerful in generating more content because no model can keep going without training data. Um, and this is the same thing we saw in social media early on. Social media sucked all the value out of content. Um, but now you see in influencer markets and others, the creators, the Mr. Beasts of the world are the ones who have all the power because they're the ones who drive the engagement through the system. You could see the same thing here from an LLM perspective. So in that Getty Images model, uh, if I'm looking for an image training set, I'm more I'm willing to pay a premium mm -hmm. under Getty because I know that everything is. I don't know if validated is it that now validated. I don't think is the right word, but I have a, a brand and trust when I'm getting my training data from a Getty Images. Yeah, is exactly. that? Yeah. So if, if part of my prompt, well, it's certified in a way and validated in a way that I can feel comfortable with, so I'm not going to get a lawsuit later. But if I go in, I say, hey, find me you know, create images with this prompt in the style of Ansel Adams, right? Um, Ansel Adams should get some monetary credit for the result, the derivative works off of his, his works. And so that's the point, right? You can kind of go back, you can encourage greater, you know, creators to put their greater content in, um, and feed that beast. Um, and then they get money back. Everyone's happy. Yeah. And one of the things that you mentioned earlier, uh, a couple of minutes ago was just the concept of data ownership. Mm -hmm. Uh, how does that, you know, can you expand on how you see data ownership in a world of AI, especially, you know, whatever world you may see? Yeah, I think, so, you know, it's interesting. We had kind of the rise of NFTs and blockchain, um, and obviously the use cases for those haven't panned out as they, you know, when they were at the top of that hype cycle uh, the same way. But you can easily see those type of devices, watermarking, et cetera, being extremely important as we move forward to protect ownership of data um, and content and make sure that no matter where it went digitally, you're still getting credit back for what you've done and what you've posted, shared, et cetera. Um, but I absolutely see a greater need for the digital security on the back end to connect these in either the ways that have already come up in blockchain or new and inventive ways through watermarks and other things that are going on. Yeah. So. When I think of data, uh, I use actually use a, a Bitcoin a, a analogy that you, the Bitcoiners use quite often. Yeah. And Bitcoiners will tell you that when you give your money to a bank, yeah. it's no longer your money. The oh. bank has written you an IOU yeah. that that you have entitlement to, but the yeah. bank goes off and does whatever it can to optimize that deposit. Yeah. So it's your, but it's not really yours. It's now the bank's. Yeah. And like that's something the Bitcoiners use. And I, I'm trying to, I, th I see a parallel with data. When you give your data to a public cloud provider, mm -hmm. it, much like a bank, it is no longer your data. You have access to it. You have an IOU for it, but it yeah. is in their system. Yeah. And so, you know, I think one of the value propositions of decentralized storage is data sovereignty, data control, yeah. uh, you know, pulling out, you know, there's no single point of failure and there's just frankly more control in a decentralized ecosystem. So you, the user, the creator have, you know, you know where it's going, you're providing access, you're doing, you have more control and efficacy, uh, just 
effectiveness over how your data is used, where it's stored, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So how do these concepts reconcile with the world of AI that you see? So I think, I think you're spot on, on kind of the need for decentralized within that and kind of have ownership in an environment that, uh, is controlled the way you want to control it, right? Because you're, you're right in this. We talked to a lot of partners who are in the content space, publishers, et cetera. And there was a freedom of access of content before that they're suddenly becoming very uncomfortable with. They, they started to get uncomfortable with it with like Facebook and others and crawling there. But the idea that their content is now going into something that can produce iterative works off of them, like you already have SEO companies literally taking articles as they're published and remixing them just slightly and reposting um, as a derivative work. And that's happening in seconds. And so I think you're going to see more people try and get into those decentralized environments, um, and to control and own. Um, but the other thing I'd say too, on that, which you touched a little on, but is really important. I probably should have brought it up when you said, what are the things they're not seeing? It's the security aspect. Um, generative AI is going to amplify security threats in a way we probably 100 X them in a way we have never seen. Um, Okay, uh, now we're cooking. So, Let's okay. talk. <laughs> so, well, and my thought there is very, it's a very simple one. Um, and I was, we were, I was just having a meeting with one of the, the CISO of one of the major banks here in the US last week, and this came up and he articulated it well. Like the, the security is based on the idea that most criminals are honestly not that smart. Um, like that's the reason crime doesn't proliferate the way it does is because they're not that smart. And when you look at even digital security issues, it's usually brunt force attacks. Right when the, the cat gets out of the bag, it's because someone in you know Eastern Europe made a really cool key that then they sell to others. So there's one smart guy powering other, a bunch of other folks. Um, and so from a perspective of brunt force attacks, you can kind of manage that. Um, if you give the power of AI to all of these people um, who have ill intentions, um, AI is going to make them seem like super criminals um, because in his example was a great one. Like they've got. In their cloud infrastructure, they've got, say, a thousand ports at any one time that they're managing. Um, there are always security slip ups, right? You're, tra- you're, you're doing a production upload. Um, one of those ports gets exposed in a way you weren't expecting. Um, luckily, it's only out there for you know a day or so and someone catches it. Um, but in their world, they're imagining a world where they're managing thousands of these ports. And if one gets exposed for 10 seconds, an AI system that's constantly scanning what they're doing is going to find it in that 10 seconds not only exploit it, but then it's going to exploit it in a way that is hard for you to even detect inside because it's smarter, right? It's adaptable. It's not playing off of a logic string of a typical code. And now it's going to be like a true smart worm that comes into your system. And so when we think about security, you're going to have to think about what if the criminals got really smart and they all had this. Um, And that is a scary, scary world to think about um, before you even think about the logic of AI getting better. So what do you, like, how do you begin to solve that problem as a CISO? Yeah, I, I think, so a couple of things is, and this is when I talk AI governance, you know, we say AI governance, but it's really just good governance. Um, there's a lot of companies who've gotten by with mediocre governance and they're going to have to apply it to AI, but also think about the uniqueness of AI. Um, it means the things you should expect with your data and your systems, right? You should be airtight on, on what you're doing. There should be redundancy uh, to your systems and your, and your data. Uh, there should always be a backup plan to the backup plan. Um, and data storage is no different, right? I would, I would tell people, um, you should divide up your data where everywhere you go, back it up in 50 places, um, and make sure you got each of those secure. Um, that's what people are gonna have to think about. Um, <laughs> if, if none of the audience caught that, that is the file coin pitch from Chris Hackney. <laughs> there you go. Glad I could help on that. <laughs> there it is, folks. And that's a wrap. No, uh, I, I think that was eloquently put. Um, more redundancy, less single points of failure, uh, more security and encryption. You know, these are the trend, these are the, the the speaking point trends that we see people talk about. I, I do think that uh, like you in, in decentralized storage. It could come like for us. It comes from a product manager, an IT service manager. Uh, it, you know, it's these different pockets. But what you haven't seen yet is a holistic approach to like how do we solve these cha- data data issues or problems that we fa- face because they're all intertwined with security. It's intertwined with AI, and you know, you we're not at the point where 
the top levels of a major organization are thinking this all the way through. They're kind of just solving these issues in silos. And I, I do think that's natural because you need someone doing this at, on a small scale within an organization to prove it out to the larger organization that, you know, this needs to be included in the conversation. And that goes for you know both topics that we're, we're discussing, whether it's risk management and AI, or like how, how do you just store data decentrally to you know minimize risk or to prove that your data is intact. Right. Yep. Exactly. So I, I, I think I think it's going to surprise most of the folks in those roles how quickly this is going to happen. And there will be a couple of these Cambridge Analytica moments where it shocks people and meaning you're not only going to have a, a ransomware event, you're going to have 50 all at once um, with 50 major companies or utilities or someone dealing this with this, that's going to open people's eyes. Um, because that's the, the advantage of AI is you can generate AI is you can scale extremely smart things really quickly. Hmm. So I think this is actually the perfect segue into Vegas for next yeah. week. And I, you know what, full disclosure, I haven't researched the breach. Uh, yes. but it's been the MGM never- fixed yet? Like it's, it's funny that you guys are doing it at the MGM. Right. <laughs> And I don't know if AI was involved. All I know is a major security breach throughout all of MGM properties. Uh, our event will be at a, an a MGM property next week in Las Vegas. Do you think that this is an example of what we've been discussing? I would imagine it's an early one. I, I always hate to lean too too far out on my skis on something you don't have first first party information on, but the scale of it seems like someone experimenting. Just like everyone's experimenting in ChatGPT and other things, there's probably nice black hat toolkits that are starting to come up that are much more sophisticated than they used to be. Um, I would say, I, honestly, the, here's the hardest part for security. It, it's the one thing that bugs me about security. And, and even I've been in corporate America a long time about corporate America and I've dealt with these. Um, the things you find about out about in security are only like this much of what actually happens because no one wants to go public with their issue, um, whether it's ransomware, like the, the dirty secret of every cybersecurity indus- industry expert is right. Most ransomware gets paid out. Um, that's why there's more of it, but no one talks about it. And I, I really did. Wi- I do wish more companies would talk honestly and forthright about it. It's it's a black eye in the short term, but it really helps everyone in the long term um, if they're more forthright about the real risk there. Interesting. Makes yeah. sense. No one wants to be the first one to say, yeah, we had a, we had a vulnerability. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so I hope I, I really, I'd say to that point, I really hope the MGM group comes out with a, a debrief on, on what happened there. Um, I'm sure they're doing it by the way, internally with other CISOs at, at, uh, other casinos and operations like that in hospitality, but you would hope also general awareness starts to rise because of some forthrightness there. Right. Yeah. Uh, put out the APB for Danny Ocean, see if it <laughs> so, so Chris, Tell me, tell everyone what's on store uh, for Vegas next week for you. Yeah, and for me, um, I, my hope is to educate at this point. Um, a lot of folks don't know what even responsible AI is, right? The principles that guide it. And these principles, it, again, if you've dealt with it as a, as a uh, man, risk management expert like SOC 2 or other things, they're common sense, right? This is about transparency, accountability, security, um, you know, I always equate these things to, you know, I'm a licensed private pilot. I got my license. Um, every pilot has to go through a, a, a checklist before they take off. Right. And when you go through that checklist, it's the dumb stuff. It's like, you know, have you checked this gauge? Have you done X? Um, but the reason you go through it is because if you miss one thing, uh, you jeopardize the lives of many people. Um, and that's why, even though it's rote and redundant, you do it. And I look at responsible AI and governance the same way. Um, can it get boring? Is it common sense and, and whatnot? Is it a checklist? Yes. But it's an extremely important one because if you miss some things, even things you think are common sense that are given, big, big negative ramifications can happen, especially in a generative AI world where uh, the scale of the, these systems run in a wrong way can really cause a lot of harm. And that's what I want to educate and focus people on is uh, you know, you're not going to get into the details of what should I do tomorrow necessarily, but we're starting a thought process um, as an industry takes off. And this is, by the way, this is the same things that happened with the people talked about, you know, the, the both the positives and the perils of the internet when it came out, social. 
Um, you know that you, and social is close enough. We remember those stories. Oh my God, it's great. We're connecting people. Um, but what about letting people into your environment that way? How do you protect your, your privacy? How do you protect your kids, right? In an environment like this or things we had to start to talk about because of social. Um, I think you're going to have to have those same discussions here. And if we can start that on our side around responsible AI, it's a win. Yeah. And what I'm excited about is your audience will be some of the biggest data and storage backend infrastructure nerds on the planet. Uh, and I, I think they're hungry and eager to be leaders in this space, innovate faster than others to make sure that the, any data associated with responsible AI can be stored, can be stored at scale, can be compliant, uh, fits into risk management software approaches, everything, you know, certifications from ISO to SOC, yeah. uh, HIPAA. I, I do think this is going to be an expanded conversation and, my prediction is that responsible AI and um, decentralized storage and the, the value of uh, data integrity are just going to get uh, more intertwined as, you know, especially regulation comes forward. Uh, I, I see a lot of, op I get optimistic about regulated industries where, you know, you won't be able, you all have to maintain that AI training set. Uh, you won't, yeah. you, you'll be required to store it. Um, and, you know, these are going to be large sets that you're going to have to store for, you know, maybe 10 years, maybe yeah. 12 years, 20 years, who knows? And, you know, is public cloud going to be your best? I mean, yeah, you're, well, there's not one solution. There's going to be many solutions. Yeah. You know, you can, you can do Uber one day and Lyft the next. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I see, like, you're, you're going to need some differentiation, no single points of failure uh, yeah. as that reality comes to fruition. Yeah, and I'd agree with that. And, and honestly, my hope for, for your audience next week and the general audience listening to this is I hope you feel empowered, right, um, you know, in your roles to speak about these things, to advocate for them. I, I got to be honest, I've been in these, these areas a long time. Risk management is a thankless exercise. You know, no one, no one loves the person who's coming up in the role and going, well, what about this risk? Um, while everyone else is trying to move extremely fast. Um, but it's the one that saves everyone at the end. Like, and my, my hope on always risk management is the best risk management is the one where nothing happens, right? And you know, maybe half the team is telling you, I told you so, we didn't have to do it. But you don't want to be the one who has that incident um, and has to deal with it. And so it's a thankful exercise, a thankless exercise uh, for a lot of folks or role. But I really hope they feel empowered to speak about what's right and what should be done coming out of these type of discussions, All right? So Chris, our time's almost up and I, do, I don't want to spoil everything that people can see live in Vegas, but if you were to leave our audience with one piece of advice or insight about responsible AI, what would it be? So it's, yeah, the, the one insight is just simply it has to be done by design, right? The governance by design or responsible AI by, de by design has to be a part of your culture, right? It can't be one team as a committee working on it and then trying to push that through the rest of the org. Um, and as a culture, it means others have to embrace it. It has to come from the top down. Um, and those are the things you need to push. It has to be by design. Your, your head of engineering has to agree with your head of marketing and your head of sales on how you're going to approach it. And it has to be a question you ask through everything you're doing, especially as AI becomes a part of everything you're doing, right? There is nothing off limits at a company around generative AI right now. When you say that, my reaction is, you know, you, you talked about some of the conversations you were having earlier about where does the responsibility sit? And when you, when you share that insight, to me, my reaction is, well, then it sits in product mm -hmm. because product is the one that brings everyone to the table for design and sets design. Mm -hmm. It's they bring in eng, they bring in marketing, they bring in security. They're the ones who push it out to make sure it's integrated into every aspect of the business. Yeah. I think if we're talking- uh, am, I, am I biased there? No, I think if we're talking technology companies, which we're typically talking to in these settings, I say absolutely, right? But it could be, you know, if you're dealing with hospitality like MGM, it might be the service side, like the service and the experience are the heart of what they do. Um, I'd usually find what is the heartbeat of the experience that you're delivering? And sometimes that's products, services could be, and you emanate from there. But I, I can't stress enough, you know, it's funny when you're younger, people say culture, 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 and you're like, ah, okay, you get a little older. You do realize culture is really important and it's a differentiator. The difference between Tesla and Ford 
at the heartbeat of it is a cult, a very big cultural difference, right? About where they're going and how they innovate and the speed by which they do it. Um, and I think it makes a huge difference in areas like this. Hmm. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Where can people find you online? Where can people learn about AI Guardian? Yeah. Uh, so we, we have this thing called a website. Very exciting for us. Uh, so, so AI guardian uh, pretty straightforward, uh, there. Um, but also can reach out to me in LinkedIn in places I'm, I'm in all the places you'd hopefully find a guy like me, uh, along the way, um, and Twitter, uh, or X, I guess we're calling it X now. Um, X as well. I can't do it. I, I'm still calling it Twitter. <laughs> and I'll if be, you're I'll be a boomer and if you're in Vegas on Wednesday next, next week, I'll be in Vegas. Oh, there you go. Excellent. Well, Chris, hopefully this is the first of many. Looking forward to your uh, presentation in Vegas. Thank you for joining another episode of D-Web Decoded. Uh, Thank you all for joining and we'll see you soon. Thank you.